Do you get a lot of stuff just like shipped to you from everywhere, or do you do you actually go out and try to buy it yourself? I actually go out and buy it myself. That's one of the big things. I think I've gotten in my collection maybe about maybe about two or three bottles from distilleries, but for the most part, it's always been my self purchasing bottles. Man, a lot. You're doing it wrong then. <laughs> Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or the bourbonconcierge.com, and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to NoseYourBourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. Just Kenny here tonight. Ryan can't join us. Ryan is on vacation down in Florida. He's down there hunting for some bourbon. That's if you weren't, uh, if you were listening last week on the community round table, he was trying to get some secrets out of Blake of trying to figure out when BTAC was going to be released down there. So he's probably hitting up ABCs and everything like that. Uh, but even in Kentucky this week for anybody that's, that hasn't paid attention to Blake's posting on his, uh, the Pappy hunt. Well, it has finally hit in Kentucky. It's now here. Uh, the hunt is harder and harder and harder. Uh, and so we're, we're starting to find that out the hard way from all the group of friends that we're in and trying to figure out how we can finagle our way into, uh, talking to some liquor store owners and everything like that. It's, it's just getting harder and harder. Um, came away so far with a 10. That's all I've got so far. So I, you know, I can't complain, but Hey, it's, it's something at the end of the day. And, um, you know, you, you got to wait around for some of the raffles to come. And it just seems like that's what most owners thinks that's the most fair way to go. Um, but, you know, feature zone. So with that, uh, I want to kind of go ahead and just move along. And uh, because really our, our show today isn't uh, going to be talking about anything that's limited releases or anything like that. But really, it's, it's talking about, um, you know, how do you how do you look at a, at a particular whiskey or scotch or 
bourbon and and really know uh, should you go out and buy it. Um, our guest tonight has probably reviewed every single bourbon or whiskey or scotch that you've seen on the shelf, and you can watch his reviews. So tonight we have Chris Trevino. Chris is the man that's known as Liquor Hound or what we would call the YouTube sensation of Liquor Hound. So Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Kenny. So before we get started on on what you do and some of the, the things that, that are part of it, kind of talk about how you got started in just whiskey in general. Okay, so uh, my story kind of goes back quite a ways. Actually, it was probably about 20 years ago when my buddy started. Actually, I started with tequila because my buddy would go down to Mexico to visit his family. and He'd bring back bottles of tequila. And so I started you know, I wasn't really drinking, tasting anything back then. So I ended up having like 20 bottles of tequila. And next thing you know, I got into whiskeys and then I started getting into rums. I started covering every category, but whiskeys are the ones that really started hitting my, I don't know, the, the core of me. You know, that's what, those are the ones that really kind of burnt a little fire and got it going as far as, you know, really wanting to learn more and really diving hard into uh, learning distil- uh, distillation techniques or learning the history behind uh, scotch and, um, you know, bourbon as well, American whiskeys. And so that probably started probably about 15 years ago, really for me. And so was it just something about the brown water that made you like it? Or it was just, I mean, cause you said you started with tequila, um, in, and believe me, I'm not what I would call a tequila connoisseur by any means, but uh, I know it wasn't Jose Cuervo. And I can know that, uh, I mean, tequila and, and whiskey are, are two very, very different, um, you know, sides of the ballpark here. Right. So, so what kind of made you do that switch? Was it, was it just because the whiskeys taste better? Or did you have something that was like, oh, there's a lot more heritage happening here? Like, what was the, maybe a big turning point there? It was kind of an evolution of my growing, I think, as, uh, you know, a spirit enthusiast, I guess, or a collector. Because once I had gotten enough tequilas, I wanted to kind of broaden out and kind of expand the bar. And that's when I got into bourbons. But like I said, when I got into bourbons, uh, it's just that just the overall flavor profiles, they're bigger. They're uh, usually more complex than tequila. And so it was those type of characteristics that really drew me in. Single malt's the same way. They're doing that. They're still amazing me to this day, just like a lot of bourbons are. So I want you to talk a little bit about what is Liquor Hound, because some people might not have heard of it before. So I want to give all of our listeners an idea of, of what it is you actually do. Right. OK, so Liquor Hound is actually started again, probably around 2000. Uh, what was it? 2010, I think is when I began. And what I had been doing was I was growing this collection and it was getting pretty large. And so I wanted to see. I wanted to look on YouTube and see what other people are doing because I knew I couldn't be the only one with this, you know, a collection of spirits. So I went on there and it was like one or two guys and that was it. And I was like, there's got to be more. So I figured, well, if I can't watch the videos, I guess I'll start shooting the videos. And so my very first one was just a little overall review of my collection at the time. And um, then I actually started getting requests to review bourbons, you know, review rums, review different spirits. And so that's when I started getting online, shooting videos, uh, reviewing bottles at a time, or in the beginning, it would be like 10 vodkas at a time or something like that, you know, something crazy. I kind of slowed that down now, but um, that's what I do. A lot of video reviews. I also do a lot of um, consultation for some some distilleries, um, restaurants and bar consultations. I do private tasting classes and educational classes. Uh, Bourbon right now, that's the one that I seem to be doing a lot of, a matter of fact. Is it because there's just a big bourbon boom? Do you think it just has more popularity or more scotch drinkers switching to bourbon or vice versa? What do you think? What do you think attributes to that? I think it's mainly the bourbon boom and also the fact that it's, you know, America's spirit. So the historical aspect of it is kind of uh, bleeding into our culture and where people are enjoying bourbon. And of course, the boom's happening at the same time. So they want to learn more. And so they, you know, they, they look for you know, they're thirsty for that education, for that experience. And when someone like me can actually present, you know, maybe a tasting of a rare bottle, let's say, that's something that most people sadly now has become very hard to do. You know, BTAC Pappy, like we all try to and love to find, but it's hard for even people like myself to get now. So it's, you know, it's a rare luxury type thing, almost situation to be able to taste that and share with your friends. So let's talk about your your kind of your stats real quick. So how many whiskeys do you have and how many videos 
have you done? Okay, so I think I'm at 101 videos and I actually shot one the other day when my lapel mic died on me. So I had to, uh, I have to reshoot that probably tomorrow. Uh, but I think right now on the whiskey front, I'm sitting at something like 350 bourbons and what are my scotch count? I'm trying to remember. I think it's something like another 300 or something on the single malt. So about 600 or so. Just, uh, just 600 bottles on the shelf, you know, it's, it's, when it's nothing, right? <laughs> so it, it sounds like you've got some some room for, for more videos to come then. Definitely, definitely more room for videos. Um, you know, the overall collection right now is just about to crack 2,400 bottles in total. Oh, so wow. Got a lot of bottles, uh, but I just need to get the time to shoot those videos. <laughs> now, is that inclusive of tequilas and rums and all that kind of thing as well? Exactly. And that also includes backup bottles because, you know, sometimes when you have those great ones come out, you want to pick up one or two so you don't run out. So I don't even want to ask, like, is this all in your house or do you have a storage unit? There's no way that's in a house, right? In a house. (laughs) 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 I'm trusting that in no storage facility. (laughs) So you you must have a very, um, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, forgiving significant other then. Yes. And I have a very full closet. (laughs) One very <laughs> full closet. <laughs> so, I mean, let's let's talk about some of the reviews in themselves. I mean, do you consider yourself like a, a sommelier of, of whiskey? Well, kind of. I mean, I'm, I am certified specialist of spirits, so I do have that qualification uh, title. But actually, I, you know, when I took that test, I was actually surprised at kind of how easy that was. I was kind of wishing it was more like the wine side of things where they were doing levels, you know, a first level, a second level, third level type thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I passed that and it was, like I said, easy. So I, all my studying and all my uh, reading on, on the backgrounds of all these spirits, I think I'm definitely in that category. And it's something that I would like to try to find a course that would, or a certification. I want certifications where people with the love of spirits can get, you know, graduate type certifications, you know. And, and I guess a lot of that tasting, I mean, um, let's talk about, I guess, your your process, right? Because, um, you know, you have you start because you have a simple tasting with you on YouTube. Um, however, these videos take a solid 10 or 15 minutes a piece. So kind of yeah. talk us about your process of, of what you go through in a typical video. Okay. So the first thing I always like to do is try to talk a little bit about the history behind that bottle, whether that be the rarity of the actual juice inside it or maybe the distillery that it came from. As you know, a lot of these uh, bourbons or uh, American spirits come from closed distilleries nowadays or some of it mixed in. So, you know, people want to hear that aspect of it. Uh, once we do that, then I'll usually already have the glass poured and uh, breathing a little bit so that by the time I get to the nosing, it's kind of relaxed and calmed down. And I'll go through the nosing uh, of the whiskey and I usually try to keep it very simplistic. And it's not only because... Um, my for myself, but also for viewers, I always appreciate honesty and simplicity when it comes to reviews. You know, I've heard some reviews that, you know, they get out of hand and it's like, you know, I've never had that. I don't even know what that tastes like, you know, and it's confusing. So I try to keep it very simple. And then when I get to the actual tasting part, it's, um, you know, I mean, you want me to talk about how I actually run it over the palate and all that type of stuff? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think kind of talk a little bit more in depth, right? I okay. mean, Maybe you're giving away some trade secrets, yeah, but yeah. you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's kind of like a fine cognac. Like they'll always tell you a cognac, you're supposed to take like a small bit when you first introduce it to your palate, just a small drop or two on your tongue, kind of roll it around. And then, then you go in for that bigger sip. So you'll always see me. I know I used to preach it a lot in my early videos of don't ever judge that first sip because that first one is just a little coating, get the viscosity feel. And then that second one is where you're actually starting to judge. I'm starting to, to feel what that viscosity is and how it enters. Is it creamy? Is it sharp? Is it thin? You know, is it oily and viscous? And uh, once we're past that part, then I start trying to identify the initial flavors, the mid palate flavors and the finishing. How long is it? Is it drying, bitter, tannic? Um, What kind of cinnamons? Is it a sharp cinnamon like a Saigon cinnamon or is it a nice, easy baking type of cinnamon? You know, different qualifications like that is what I'm looking for. So I, I want to talk a little bit about 
um, your background with that too, because I'm back on episode 30. We had talked to Robert and Tom from Aroma Academy Sensory Training, and I kind of want to talk to you. Are were you kind of like self-taught, or did you go to a class? Like, how did you learn to start pulling out these scents? Because I'm starting to get into it a little bit, mm-hmm. and of course, we're always like, oh, caramel and vanilla. Oh, that's oh, that smells like every bourbon that's on the market, <laughs> right? So I guess kind of talk about what you know, how you kind of uh, got to that point where you can start pulling out those scents or those flavors? Well, I think one of the biggest helps for me happened to be a, one of those uh, wines, uh, sensory type kits that you could get. I think I have one that had something like 200 or 250 little vials and each one would have, you know, a different scent to it. And so you could kind of train and work your nose on, you know, what all those different scents kind of smell like. And then sometimes you run into um, like a lot of different oak type characters in bourbon. So you might get cedar, you might get uh, a eucalyptus type effect or something like that. So in those cases, if you don't find them in those little vials, you can just go to your local supermarket usually and find, you know, different herbs or uh, something you've never had and kind of pick it up, smell it, you know, maybe taste it a little bit or buy it and taste it if it's, you know, if you really need to learn, buy a lot of it. But that's usually how I learn. Just gives me an excuse to buy a Hershey's bar if you need to be like, I need to understand how the chocolate tastes again, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess a, a good question is with you, you know, I kind of said like, oh, uh, caramel vanilla, like that's the kind of sense that we get kind of off of everything. I mean, do you get tired of always saying it, it smells like caramel and vanilla? I mean, what are the, some of the more common scents that you get out of yes. uh, a lot of these different whiskeys? It's, the, I mean, the most common ones are, you're exactly right. It's caramel, vanilla, uh, sometimes butterscotch, but usually always some level of brown sugar. Uh, those are the main ones, those sweet, rich, fudgy type car- uh, aromatics and tastes. So talk about some of the glasses that you use, because sometimes you use Glencairn, sometimes you use some uh, whatever kind of taller stem ones. Uh, because I know that uh, we, we've talked about it before that the the way that it sits in the glass, the density, it, it affects the aroma and all the other kind of things. So kind of talk about that a little bit. Okay. So for a long time, I was using Glencairn's and I still, that's like the go-to glass. It seems like it's a really real, uh, well-rounded glass to use. I have some of the neat glasses. I have some of the new uh, Norlin glasses. Have you heard of those? Yeah. Yeah, kind of talk about that real quick because I, maybe a lot of people don't know about it. Okay, so the Norlin glass is almost like a the shape of a tumbler, uh, except that it's almost like a double walled tumbler. So the outside is the size of a, again, let's say the word tumbler, and then we'll throw a Glencairn on the inside of it, and you connect the two, and it's all blown glass. So you get this little almost like an insulating wall, and then at the very bottom, the most unique characteristic to the Norlin glass is it has these little bumps almost like little ridges on the inside of that Glencairn so that when you're swirling the whiskey it's actually creating more aeration and kind of releases those molecules a little more up into the air so that you're able to get a little bigger nose and that's the selling point on it Uh, what I found on that glass is it doesn't really work very well for the majority of the lower proof spirits that's what I have personally felt um, I think if you're talking now, I, the one whiskey that does work phenomenally in it happens to be Scotch whiskey, and that would be Isla whiskeys in particular. Uh, those smoky, big, peaty whiskeys kind of need that that room to breathe and aerate. To whereas some bourbons, um, I find that the Glencairns are best unless they are high proof. If you're talking cast strength bourbon, that's when I like to use those tall stem. Uh, they're tip. They're well, they're modeled after the Eich glass, uh, the German uh, glass company. And those glasses, very expensive. I think you can get them on bedbathandbeyond.com for something like 150 or so for two. Very what? Expensive. Yes. And they're very delicate. And I didn't like that. Um, I've gone to, uh, I'm part of the Dallas Single Malt Society. And when we're there, there's some guys there that have the, the real Eich glasses. And they do make a difference on high cast strength uh, spirits. So when you're doing a single malt in a Glencairn and then you do it in that glass as well, you'll notice a pretty appreciative difference. Um, wow. I didn't, I didn't expect that. Yeah. Now, like I said, the ones I use are not the Aish. Uh, they're actually by, I think it's like Luigi. I can't remember the last name of that company. I get them on Amazon, um, but they're like six for like $50. They're not very expensive. 
I think they're, they're Vinotech. So if you look up Vinotech Spirit Snifter on Amazon, that's where they are. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's point of sale Go Mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning 24 7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase, and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. So with the glasses, is there is there a go-to that, you, I mean, you said Glenn Cairn's kind of your go-to. What makes you decide to, to go with um, whether the tall stem or the Glenn Cairn or um, yeah. the, uh, what was it, start with an N again? I, I remember. I just, New Orleans. New Orleans. New Orleans. Yeah. I want to say like New Orleans, but you know how I always say it, like New Orleans. Yeah, it's kind of the other <laughs> say it like that. <laughs> well, the uh, the Glenn Cairn, like I said, that's a, no problem. If you're going to run a cast strength in there, you're going to be okay. It may push you out of that glass a little bit because of the amount of heat and that alcohol. Uh, but the um, I'll usually choose the tall stem, more tulip shaped bowl if it's going to be cast strength. That's usually where I'll go to for those. If it's not cast strength, I'm usually just going to go straight into a Glen Karen. If it's an Isla whiskey, and and I have to say this, I haven't given the Norlin uh, glass enough chance. I will say that because I haven't run a lot of bourbons through it. I haven't run a lot of single malts through it. Uh, I've run a few Highland malts, a few bourbons. Uh, and a lot of eyeless through it. And that's the one, like I said, I found that really works well. So I want to talk about, you know, we're at the point now where you're taking a drink. Now, for every every bottle that you have, I've noticed that they're usually already cracked open at some point. So have you already tried them beforehand before you record? Or is it kind of like you, you sometimes you uh, you pour a little out for the homies and then you and then you uh, yeah. take, take, take it for recording? What I'll usually do is when I first crack a bottle, I'll usually be with a couple of friends. And so we'll taste it together. And so you'll see that level down. I may have only had a half ounce. It may have been a week before I shoot the video. Uh, But usually I do have it a little pre-tasting. But as far as the actual day of the shoot, no, I don't taste beforehand. I just go ahead and go right on into it. There are some instances, some videos I've done where I have, you know, immediately just come home with a bottle, set it all up cracked that bottle and just shot the review. And to me, it's, it's the same either way because I'm unbiased. Even if I taste it a week before the day before I don't write notes or keep anything like that. So it's always off the top of my head, how it's hitting me. So it also seems that when you're taking a drink and you take your sip, maybe it's your second sip, right? Cause you always said, never judge it by the first, but it seems like you're always like, maybe like rolling your tongue or something like that. Are you doing that to maybe get some more after flavors or anything like that? So kind of talk about part of that process. So what I'll do is once I take it in and I've, and I've ran it across my palate and got that viscosity re- uh, little reading, I'll go ahead and just let it go down. And then what I'll start doing is taking little breaths in. So through my mouth, just little puff in and going out my nose. So you'll see me on the videos, you know, kind of <laughs> kind of like you like you lost your breath a little bit, right? Just kind of and I'm just searching for those little aromatics, those other smells that are going to come through. So, yeah, that's that's what I do. 
<laughs> it, I mean, honestly, it, it is almost like comical at times, right? Because you, if, if you watch yourself, you're kind of like, maybe like, oh, I kind of look like an idiot. I'm sitting there just like taking these <laughs> small deep breaths or whatever it is. But, yeah, but that's, that's how I've developed it, you know, and that's how I find uh, I can pull the most out of it. And um, uh, yeah, I've been doing that from day one. Uh, the other thing that I didn't mention of when it comes to nosing, of course, most of y'all already know, when it comes to nosing a bourbon or any spirit for that matter, um, you need to have your lips parted, you know, and kind of breathe in through your nose and your mouth at the same time. It kind of just helps regulate that heat and lets you pull in more. So I've noticed also sometimes you, you add water every once in a while. So I want to talk about it because it started in some of the later episodes. Talk about some of the water that you use and the amount of drops you put into a whiskey. Uh, that's, you know, and how do you, how many drops do you put in depending on whether it's just your, you go with five, you go with 10, like what's the magic number? Great, great question. So for me, what I usually like to do is I like to, well, I used to use uh, spring water, never use distilled because distilled strips the minerals from the water and it actually can make, the whiskey tastes a little weird sometimes if you use distilled. So I like to use spring water. Uh, recently, I've been switching to the old limestone water from Kentucky. You can get it on Amazon. It's like $10 for 750 milliliters, which is crazy for water. But, you know, what are you going to do? I don't live near there. Now, um, but I get that water in. I have my little droppers. I actually have one. You know, just you can get those on Amazon as well, just little droppers. And what I'll end up doing is putting... Uh, depends on the proof. Again, if it's an 80 proof bourbon, maybe just a drop just to crack it and see how it's going to feel. Uh, if I, if it's a very soft, like a wheater, then sometimes I don't feel like it needs water. If it's just so good on its own and it doesn't need any water. Great. If it needs to, uh, be a little too spicy, or maybe it's a little tight, then drop a water in there. It'll help just release it and open it up right away. Uh, the other thing is if it's a higher proof bourbon, that's when you're going to need to add more water. So could be, let's say we're talking 110 proof. You know, I might need to add three drops to start, you know, just to kind of crack it and let it start to relax. Take, give it a few minutes because if when you first add that water, the first thing that it's going to typically release is, release is a lot of oak uh, characters. So if you add water to a whiskey and then you swirl it and you taste it, that oak might seem too big. So give it a few minutes to relax, calm back down, and then taste it. And that oak will kind of recede back and you'll get everything a little bit more. Maybe the cinnamon will drop off. Maybe the fruits and the floralness might pop a little more. Um, but water can really play a big difference in whiskeys. Yeah. So I've also noticed that you usually, you'll taste it first. You'll taste it in its raw form, barrel proof, whatever it is. And then on um, you'll, you, maybe this is why the, the videos are also like 10 to 15 minutes long too, is you'll, you'll also do like a second tasting with it while you add water in to see if any of the, the, the flavors change right yeah. or wrong. Exactly. That's exactly right. So I know my wife is always on me about the length of the video. Do not make them too long, you know, and I totally get that. And, but some whiskeys, you know, like uh, the new Booker's Rye that just came out when I shot that view, uh, review, you know, that whiskey needs to have water added. Like I need to give the review as it is straight from the bottle, as it was straight from the barrel, but I also need to do the review with water so that everybody can see, does it change? Does it get better? You know, that type of thing. I, I'll be honest. I, I watched probably like five videos today and watching a guy sniff a glass for 15 minutes has never been more entertaining. Uh, <laughs> so I, I like I like the, the longer videos, right? I mean, it, I think it's something where you're not boring anybody to death either, right? You're you're constantly talking the whole entire thing. It's not like we're just sitting there just like standing on the edge of our seat like, what's he going to say next? It's it's constant, right? So you're able to keep pushing out good information. So I do like that. I do like that. Thank you. Thank so you also talk about in some of uh, when you're when you're talking about the taste, you know, you talk about wood, you talk about oak, uh, you also talk about tannins a lot. Yes. And for somebody like me that isn't uh, very well versed in, in knowing exactly what they're trying to pick out, kind of explain to me and some of the listeners as well, like what is a tannin? Okay. So tannin is really, to me, the way I kind of describe tannins when I'm talking to a, a group of people is going to be like when the oak is pressed too hard. And what I mean by that is when whiskey is put into the barrel, you know, and it's going to start to breathe in that barrel as it, it cools. It's going to contract and that whiskey that gets squeezed into the wood when it's hot is going to contract back out. And it's that breathing of the barrel that imparts the color. It's going to impart all those 
uh, vanilla, that caramel, all those flavors that you're going to get from a whiskey that does not taste like a white dog. Um, those characters are coming from the wood. And when they're done right, you don't get a lot of oak, a lot of tannins. They just, it's so sweet. It's so nice and round with maybe a little bit of a very clean oak. But when that wood is pressed too hard and maybe it's maturing too hot or this, that, which happens to be the case a lot in Texas, a lot of our bourbons are maturing too hot. So they breathe so hard and they're pulling so much from that wood that I think they end up pulling too much from the wood. Some of the negative characteristics, those being the tannins, because what tannins will come like off on the palate is they're going to be contributing bitterness. They're going to be contributing a drying palate, dryness on the finish, uh, stuff like that. Sometimes you can get a green wood effect, kind of like a new lumber type uh, character. That's another oak to me, kind of a flaw in a whiskey. Um, but that's what I'm always searching for in tannins is, you know, is it pulling too hard from that wood? Is it pulling those tannins, that bitterness, that um, drying type quality? Oh, I might put you on the spot here. So I guess kind of give our listeners an idea of like, what's a, what's a bourbon that's like readily available on the shelves that would have like what you would consider like a, a very high tannin taste profile to it? versus one that is more well-rounded so they can sit there and try them side by side to kind of understand like how do we how do we pull that specific flavor out of it? Well, you know, the tannin part of it is one that the distilleries don't want. You know, the, typically they do not want that in their bourbon. Uh, so I'm trying to think on the low end. The one that immediately came to mind would be like, it's usually in older whiskeys because again, when they're in that wood a long time and that barrel has given all that it's got to give, and if it stays in there, it'll start just pulling out whatever's left. And a lot of times that is drying tannins. And so if you look at maybe bottles like, let's see, without throwing too many people under the bus, let's see, uh, <laughs> maybe Orphan Barrel Old Blowhard kind of comes to mind, that 26-year-old bourbon. That to me was a little dry on the back end. Um, some of the tannins were coming through, not horribly, but it was noticeable. Another one would be the... Uh, probably the Evan Williams 23, Evan Williams 23. That's another one that I've had a few times, few different bottles, and it always just seemed to be over oaked. And you'll get that. That's a quality of, to me, of a tannic type environment is over oaked, over wooded bourbon. That's when you're starting to pull the negatives out of that barrel. Uh, but to think of one that's on the shelf besides those two at a more reasonable cost, ugh. I mean, even if we think, well, I mean, we, Elijah Craig, when it still had the 12-year age statement, was that sort of still well-balanced or over tannin? Like, what, what would you think about oh, just because if oh. I'm thinking of something that's a an age-stated thing that's out there that's kind of a higher age statement, I that's the only one that comes to my mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would probably say that one could possibly do it, but their batches were usually pretty consistent. I mean, I love the EC12 for forever, still do, uh, but... Uh, the ones that I'm thinking, maybe some Texas bourbons. If you ever taste a Texas bourbon, they'll be very rich in the uh, fresh ground corn type character. That's like a dead giveaway for to me for a Texas bourbon. Um, but after you get past that corn, ground corn character, then the first next thing you're going to get is a high heat level, almost like on the level of a Booker's, let's say, that high spice, high heat. Uh, and then on that back end, to me, I, I tend to get some drying notes, just dark chocolate type characters. And that's so I guess, you know, Texas yeah. bourbon comes to mind. Harrison Brothers is really the only one around here that that we can find pretty re readily available. Yeah, Garrison Brothers has been doing better. I know the 2015, they finally I think they're doing away with the fall spring releases. You know, for a long time, uh, I used to know Dan and talk to Dan and he would tell me that they were kind of targeting two different flavor pro, uh, profiles for the fall and the spring. They said the spring release, they were going for a more floral, easy drinking bourbon. And then in the fall, they were going for that spicier, warmer bourbon to you know kind of keep you warm and through the cold winter months. Uh, but in 2015... Those, those cold winter months in Texas, right? Yeah. And those icy... <laughs> we get those icy weeks, maybe. We're lucky. <laughs> but, uh, but that's what he was shooting for. And it was always kind of odd to me because, you know, you get... Okay, well, I like the springs, so I guess I only buy in the spring. Um, but now he's finally gotten to one where he's just doing a 20 vintage, 2015, 2016. And it's a, definitely a better rounded bourbon. Um, yeah, his, I don't know, his aren't, 
his aren't too bad as far as the tan is. They're definitely there. Um, but again, I don't okay. throw anybody specifically under the bus. <laughs> it's all good. So what I've also noticed in some of your videos is that, or actually mostly all your videos is that you don't actually like rate a whiskey at the end of it. Uh, is there a reason behind that? Yeah. Well, so I know I used to get asked to do ratings a lot and it's all so subjective to me. Like when I, when I watch other, when I was, you know, watching other people's reviews and, and seeing how they were giving ratings, um, malt advocate or you know all those other magazines and stuff it's subjective I, they would give something maybe an 80 score and i might love it and so and I, there's some things i love and people don't love so it's i don't want to really want to give it a score I'll, I'll tell you whether or not i think it's really good if it's very good average usually if i don't re- review it it's it possibly could be because i don't like it uh that's not the case that's not why i haven't shot all my bourbons but I know if, if I come across something I do not like, then I just don't want to review it because I don't want to be on camera, you know, just uh, you know, don't know, this. It because yeah. there will be those people out there that love that. And I don't want to, I'm not, not that guy. So, right. You know, you want to tell them their baby's ugly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I would consider, and that's what you were actually requested by uh, one of our listeners to, to have you on as a guest. And I think it's pretty easy to say that you have a, a pretty refined and, and good palate. Do you do any like private barrel picks for stores around Dallas or anything like that? I do. Matter of fact, I've done a few for uh, True Spirits up in Plano. So that's a really good store up in our area. It's a mom and pop type store. It's not a big chain. Like we have Specs and Goody Goody and Total Wine. Uh, but I've done some barrel picks for him. Uh, I've also helped in barrel picks at a few other little small local spots. And recently, I actually went to Miami to actually mix a barrel of rum. I know it's not bourbon, but I was sent down there to mix a barrel of rum for him as well. So they do enjoy it. Yeah. That sounds like fun. So I guess uh, we'll kind of wrap it up a little bit. So we'll kind of uh, finish off with two questions here. So we know that your your collection is expansive at this point. So you're, you've kind of grown from tequilas to the whiskey side. Now, just in the whiskey side, what do you prefer, scotch or bourbon? And you can feel biased since you're on the Bourbon Pursuit podcast. Yes, of course. It would have to be bourbon. You know, that's my big love in this world. <laughs> Actually, to be honest with you, I have more bourbons than I do scotch. And that's because I was totally in love with bourbon and still am. But for it was fascinated for years. I think I spent three or four years solidly on bourbon. And that's how I used to do my collection was I would spend a year on. And I know this is rough sounding for some people. I would spend a year on vodka just buying, learning about vodka. And then I'd spend a year on gin. And then I'd spend, you know, like I said, three or four years on bourbon. And I think I spent about two and on scotch. And I'm still now to the point where I don't have to focus as much, but I still buy from every category, you know. Right. And, and you were in it early enough because I've watched your videos of the, the top 10 bourbons that you've had of all time. And you've got your your Pappy 23 decanters and your PHC golden anniversary. So you've been around it long enough that you've got you got some unicorns sitting around there. Yeah, I remember buying Pappy 10, you know, when it was the paper label squatties on the shelf, you know, and I could drive around for I think I remember spending one day driving around Dallas. And I think I picked up like five or six of them. It was no big deal. They were just they're there. Of course, now it's insane. You can't do that oh, yeah. anymore. The way it is. So uh, last question, uh, any reviews coming up that our, our listeners can look forward to? Yeah, this one right here. This one's going to be coming up very soon. Let's see if we can see it. The well, Re- go ahead and so most, mostly it's audio. So kind of tell everybody what it is. Right. The Rebel Yell 10-year single barrel. So that just hit our shelves probably this week here in Dallas. Really blown away by it. Um Man, I mean, they did a, such a solid pick. And that's coming from Luxco, and they're sourcing out of Heaven Hill. So it's a wheater, uh, bottled, I think, at 100 and what are we at? 100 proof, which is not bad, but very, very good bourbon for only like $45. It was a really good buy. Oh, awesome. I guess I sh- never should have passed up on that. I can probably go find it hopefully somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, fantastic. Uh, Chris, I want to say thank you for joining the podcast tonight. So if anybody that wants to know more about you, where do they watch your videos? How do they find them? Tell them how to do that. All right. So you can find me probably best. And you can also message me there on YouTube. Uh, It's just youtube.com slash liquor hound or just search liquor hound one word on there. And that's where you can see all my videos and 
like I said, feel free to message me with comments or questions. And I always try to answer as quickly as I can. Well, fantastic. And you're also on Twitter at Liquor Hound and, and a few other different social media places, right? Facebook as well. I have a Liquor Hound page there. I have my personal page, Chris Trevino there. And that's who I am. That's what I do. Awesome. Well, thank you again for being on the show tonight. Make sure you follow him on all those great social media channels. Uh, Bourbon Pursuits also on YouTube, but it's basically just a rehash of everything you're listening to now. So if you need to yet another way to listen to our podcast while you're sitting at your office, uh, you can always get them on YouTube as well. Uh, but also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Bourbon Pursuit. If you like what you hear, make sure you support the show. That's P A T. It's on Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com slash Bourbon Pursuit. And this month, all of our uh, October pledges have been done. And so for our October giveaway, we will be having a bottle of four year Willet uh, family estate that we'll be giving away to all of our, or not all of our listeners, but one lucky listener. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I want to say thank you everybody that has supported us. Um, it's It's been tremendous so far working on getting t-shirts done as well. So you'll be seeing those and those emails coming up uh, pretty soon. Um, but lastly, Chris, want to say thank you again. And if anybody else has any more show suggestions, make sure you get back at us and we'll see you all next week. Mm-hmm.